Hello friends. Welcome to the Eastern Front channel. Today we will talk with you about the memoirs of Friedrich Paulus adjutant, Arno von Lenski, who fought with Paulus until he was captured in 1943. Deeper into the Big Don Bend the Chief of Staff of the 4th Panzer Army landed here in a Fiesler, Stork, on the 9th of July. Its staff had orders to take over command of the XXXXTH Panzer Corps, which was involved in the hard fighting that had developed near Canton Mayorovka. The Chief of Staff formed the advance party, he reported that upon the instructions of the High Command, the 4th Panzer Army was already on the march to the southeast, which entailed crossing the 6th Army's line of attack. If we were not careful, both armies could get mixed up together, which was why it needed the understanding of our staff. This was soon achieved, and the chief of staff of the Panzer Army was able to continue his flight to the XXXXTH Panzer Corps, this was able to break the Soviet resistance near Canton Mayorovka. On the 11th of July it reached the Chi near Bokovskaya, on the same day the XXXXTH Panzer Corps left the command of the 6th Army and came under the 4th Panzer Army. On the 13th of July the whole 4th Panzer Army received orders to turn south from the Chi to block the retreat to the east of the enemy weakened by the 17th Army and 1st Panzer Army, to form bridgeheads on the left bank of the Don and, finally, to take Rostov, together with the 1st Panzer Army. I was already with Paulus for the briefing, he had heard of these measures shortly before. Excitedly he paced to and fro in the low room, the advantage that the XXXXTH Panzer Corps has achieved has gone, we are still several days march from the Chi. In this situation turning the Panzer Corps to the south means that the terrain has to be fought for all over again, we are expected to carry a load that previously for armies would have been allocated, General. Unfortunately that is so, the 6th Army alone is obliged to conduct the attack on the Big Don Bend and at the same time to take over the protection of the northern flank which will become longer day by day, I have heard from Voelter that the 2nd Hungarian Army will take on part of the task, I replied. Correct, Adam, but until now the majority of the Hungarians are in the area south of Voronezh, where they fought in Army Group, Weichs, it will take a while for the Hungarian divisions to leave their positions and be able to replace our divisions on the Don. Are we really going to conduct the attack on Stalingrad without tanks, General? According to a previous briefing by the Army Group we will get a Panzer Corps again, apparently the XIVTH, hopefully, straight away. Even a great optimist could not have been confident in the 6th Army's prospects. On the, the 20th of July we crossed the upper Chi near Bokovskaya, the place that nine days previously had been occupied by the XXXXTH Panzer Corps, two assault groups were formed for the further thrust into the Don Bend, the northern one from the XIVTH Panzer Corps, which had been attached to us in the interim, together with the VIIth Corps, and the southernmost by the List Corps. The divisions intended to protect the northern flank were placed under the XVIth Corps. The spearhead of the 6th Army was now the XIVTH Panzer Corps, on the 23rd of July its divisions forced their way into the Big Don Bend south of Kremenskaya. Within a short time the Don was reached near Syrotinskaya, but yet again this was a blow into empty space. The enemy had escaped over the Don. Replacements and supplies give concern although we had sustained no unusually high casualties since the beginning of the offensive, the fighting strength of the infantry was greatly reduced, on average the infantry companies had a fighting strength of only 60 men. Many of our men were ill as a result of uninterrupted marches that demanded all their strength to extremes, with this came circulatory problems, stomach and bowel sicknesses, caused by the unaccustomed steppe climate with its constant big swings in temperature. By day the quicksilver columns of the thermometers rose to 40 degrees, falling at night to 10 degrees, there was no protective cover for most. Erecting tents for the short rests at night was not worthwhile, but the casualties from the difficult conditions considerably exceeded the fighting casualties, understandably my concerns as the army's first adjutant increased, who would bring up the replacements to close the gaps. I telephoned the adjutant of the army group. Some weak marching companies were established from soldiers who had been released from the field hospitals as recovered and fit for the front. But what were a few hundred replacements when we needed several thousand? I briefed General Paulus on the personnel situation at the evening conference, according to Army Group the Army should receive some marching companies in the next few days. Further replacements are temporarily not available, we have now advanced fighting for about 400 kilometers. Several companies have lost a third of their original fighting strength. 
Will the army be relieved by a second batch, or will army group send us fresh divisions from the reserve? Paulicer's mouth formed a bitter smile, if the offensive reaches a certain sector, the pace of the second batch of the reserve will speed up, that is what we learnt as tactical instructors at the war school, did we not? I too know nothing else. But I must tell you that neither the one nor the other is available, in the Führer headquarters one believes it possible to throw proven basic rules of strategy and tactics to the winds, the highest command lets itself all too often be led by political and defence economic goals, and then believes them capable of achievement by our undoubtedly excellent and experienced troops. But everything has its limits. Our army is overstretched, fought out and seriously weakened should it come to decisive fighting, at the beginning of the attacks the army group had two German infantry divisions in reserve, the allies following us up should be relieving our divisions on the northern flank, but their fighting strength is only half that of our own, nor are they suitable for the attack. We will have to carry the burden of the fighting for the vulgar city on our own, how will this continue, then? Our panzer corps on the Don is already 150 kilometers ahead of the infantry divisions. That is why we have to strike for the bridges as soon as possible, apart from that, the front that we have to secure to the north will become even longer, there are not half a dozen divisions remaining for a further attack, tomorrow the 24th Panzer Corps, which previously belonged to the 4th Panzer Army, joins us, it will reinforce the right, hand attacking group of the List Corps, but what is that? To fill a hole one digs up another spot. Paulicer's critical intellect as a general staff officer could not escape from Hitler's weaknesses, mediocrity and fantasies in the conduct of warfare, this gave him concerns that nagged at him, but he was an outright soldier, believing in his knowledge and trust in his divisions, hoping to be able to compensate for the failures and faulty planning of the high command. I went back to my tent to work on some recommendations for the Knight's Cross and the German Cross in gold, but I could not get the conversation with Paulus out of my head, if he could only keep his health, for he did not look well, he stood pensively in front of the map, which was made of strong paper and hung next to his desk, I thought about it, the Red Army was making its way even further eastwards. We were becoming further and further distant from our supply bases, ever more unfavorably for the fighting requirements of our divisions, there were no proper roads and only one single, track railway, resupply was becoming increasingly difficult, a strong cloudburst, such as we experienced more than once since the attack began, was sufficient to leave the heavily laden trucks stuck in the mud, the army's transport ability hardly sufficed to bring up the required items such as ammunition, fuel, food, etc., over these wide expanses to the fighting troops, if the fuel supplies failed, the attack could often be delayed for days, the chief of staff raged, but the senior quartermaster responsible was powerless. The fuel convoys we had ordered were repeatedly diverted south to army group, uh, shortly before reaching their intended destination. Protests by the senior quartermaster, even by the army's commander, Inchef, were not taken into consideration, I was summoned by Paulus, his quarters consisted of a porch, a large room and a smaller room, he worked in the larger room, a simple right-angled table served as his desk. There was a chair on one of the long sides. A blackboard had been set up behind Paulicer's working space and on it was pinned the situation map. The commander, in, chief's personal orderly officer was responsible for keeping the map up to date. Paulus was standing in front of the map when I entered the room. The army group's chief of staff, General of Infantry von Sodenston, rang me a few minutes ago. Colonel, General von Weichs will be taking off in about half an hour. He will be visiting us. The Chief of Staff has already ordered a cross to be marked out on our landing field. You will collect the Colonel, General in my car from there, drive off straight away and check that all is in order at the landing field, my driver is on his way to your tent. The auxiliary landing strip, in the area best protected on the step, was not far from the village in which the army headquarters were located. On the edge of it stood a Ju-52, some courier machines and some storks that were used by headquarters. I waited with the commander of our air staff near the edge of the landing strip, which was marked out with white cloths. The machine soon appeared, flying very low, it crossed the air strip and came into land. Out stepped a large, gaunt general wearing horn, rimmed glasses, who looked more of a scholar than an officer, I reported myself as the 6th Army's first adjutant. Although we had never met each other before, he greeted me like an old acquaintance, nodded at the others standing around and climbed into the waiting vehicle, at headquarters he had a long conversation with Paulus and Schmidt. 
Later I heard from our army commander, in chief that it was about the difficult situation that the 6th army was in, since the withdrawal of the 4th Panzer Army. The colonel, general showed understanding and said that he would provide any possible support from his side, Paula said, of course he cannot give us new divisions, he will, however, take care to ensure that our units that are deployed on the Don to protect our northern flank are replaced by the following allied armies as soon as possible. The headquarters of the XVI Corps are to remain there. Then we will be lacking a core headquarters. The VII Corps headquarters cannot possibly command all the infantry divisions of our northern group, I ventured to say, the withdrawing headquarters will be replaced by Exith Corps headquarters, the commanding general is General of Infantry Strecker, Paulus added, I know Strecker very well, he previously had the 79th Infantry Division that supported us near Charkov. He is a man that we can leave things to. The disastrous Order No. 45 The tasks of army groups, A and B were set out in Order No. 45, upon what assumptions were the Army High Command and Weimacht headquarters operating. In the first section of the order it said, only the weakest enemy forces of Timoshenko's army have been tasked with completing the encirclement and reaching the southern bank of the Don, this was obviously a completely false interpretation of the results of the summer offensive, few prisoners taken, almost empty battlefields, and only a few dead, these were the actual facts that Order No. 45's assessment clearly contradicted. Then the goals of the further operations were set out, Army Group was to go with part of its forces into the western Caucasus and thrust along the Black Sea coast, take the Makope and Grozny oil fields, block the pass routes over the central Caucasus and finally advance to Baku. The order went on, to Army Group B, as already ordered, falls the task, after building up the Don defences in the thrust on Stalingrad, of defeating the enemy forces being built up there, of occupying the city itself and of blocking the peninsula between the Don and the Volga. In connection with this, fast units are to be deployed along the Volga with the task of thrusting towards Astrakhan and similarly blocking the main arm of the Volga there. While Order No. 41 had foreseen that the forces of both army groups would reach Stalingrad and then conduct the further operation, Order No. 45 demanded the simultaneous fulfillment of all these tasks, that is, the extension of the front from 800 km at the beginning of the summer offensive to 4,100 km at the completion of the planned operation. This inevitably meant that the striking forces of both army groups would be split, although our already recorded losses had in no way been sufficiently replaced to meet such an extensive task, this instruction altered nothing of the 6th Army's task, after the withdrawal of the 4th Panzer Army, of occupying the Big Don Bend to the south, which was our next goal. Scientific work in a steppe village yet again we had moved our headquarters forward. While my section followed with the vehicles, I myself was flown ahead in a Fiesler, Stork, we soon reached our destination. Below us lay one of the usual spread, outstep villages of small, single, story wooden houses with flowery front gardens and fenced, in yards along a wide, dusty main street, at the landing ground I was awaited by the army headquarters commandant. He gave me some brief information about the village and drew my attention to a low, sturdy brick building, which stood out. He wanted me to follow him there, do you want me to accommodate my section here? He shook his head. No, I want to show you something. Let's go in. Through the open door I saw a laboratory, on the table stood tripods, bottles and beakers, test tubes and microscopes, in a white glass cupboard lay pincers, syringes and scalpels. My further glance around fell on glass containers that apparently contained chemicals, and various bottles filled with liquids, Finally I discovered a swarm of white mice and guinea pigs, how did this laboratory come to be in this steppe village? What role did it play? Our commandant did not know either, on the way to the headquarters accommodation we met the first general staff officer. I told him of our discovery, he too could make no sense out of it, and wanted to task the chief interpreter to solve the mystery, the latter discovered from an old man that the inhabitants of this village were involved in the forefront of cattle breeding, the state had built the laboratory for them. It was directed by a veterinary surgeon who, together with her female assistants, had taken the cattle to safety away from the village when the German troops approached, in the days to follow I went past this small veterinary, medical research laboratory several times, always one of the old remaining villagers was around. Apparently a kind of guard had been organized, a sign of the value the farmers placed on this establishment, but we now had time to think about how communism apparently had a good side to it. 
The next days gave us a communist surprise of another kind. A bad atmosphere at Cayman Ski on the, the 25th of July several staff officers were sitting down after eating together. The chief of staff had already gone off to his quarters, then a signaler appeared with a radio message, which the IA officer took, this produced a donawetter from between his teeth, before he jumped up and hurried after the chief of staff, what was up? The XIVTH Panzer Corps had come up against strong enemy units in a further thrust towards the Don southwest of Cayman Ski. A bitter battle had been raging for hours, but the enemy was not giving way, that evening the XXIVTH Panzer Corps, which had recently joined the army, reported the same, it was supposed to support our list corps blocking the way to the lower Chi, in doing so it had come up against a strong enemy defensive front near Nishin, Chiskyar. The infantry divisions reported enemy resistance west of the Liska stream, once the various reports had been entered on the situation map, it was obvious that the Red Army west of Kalach had established itself in a wide bridgehead stretching from Cayman Ski to the mouth of the Chi, our corps had tried to break through the Soviet defensive front on the move and to throw the Red Army back over the Don, but they were biting on granite, and not only that, the Soviet divisions identified weak positions on our side and went into a counterattack on the, the 31st of July, throwing back our already badly decimated divisions over the Liska stream. For several days there had been a bad atmosphere in the 6th Army, the enemy, moreover, was able to get some large units across the Don to the south near Kremenskaya and place them in the rear of the XIVTH Panzer Corps, which had to turn several regiments to the north to counter this move. The XIVTH Panzer Corps now stood widely dispersed along the Don north of Cayman Ski, those infantry divisions of the 6th Army west of Klitskaya, which had been relieved by the slowly following Italian 8th Army, could now be released. The VII 8th Corps closed the Soviet bridgehead from the northwest with its divisions, having contact with the List Corps on its right wing, the southern end of the Lower Chi was blocked by the XXIVTH Panzer Corps, in this setting the 6th Army repulsed the enemy attacks and simultaneously prepared to smash the Soviet bastion. By the end of July and the beginning of August the Italian 8th Army was so far advanced that it could relieve the 6th Army's divisions deployed west of Klitskaya to protect the northern flank. Some of the XIVTH Panzer Corps regiments deployed in a security role were relieved by infantry divisions from the XIth Corps. These drove the enemy back and formed a defensive position. High-ranking visitors while preparations for the attack were being made, the 6th Army headquarters received various high-ranking visitors at its location in the steppe village. The most interesting one for me was an encounter with the Weimax Communications General, Felgebel, I got to know him through our army's chief of signals, Colonel Arnold, that evening the three of us walked to and fro along the village street. The general started speaking about the war situation. His appraisal was somewhat skeptical, almost pessimistic, we too had many concerns, but they mainly arose out of our own situation, from this or that episode in our army's area, perhaps too about the Eastern Front, Felgebel, though, had doubts about the whole war, in the west our troops stand widely separated from the North Cape to the Pyrenees, Rommel is fighting in North Africa, in Yugoslavia and Greece our divisions are conducting an exhausting little war against partisans, and what happened last year in front of Moscow you know for yourselves, hopefully all goes well for your army, I can understand Porlisser's concern about the long-stretched northern flank. If only we had not undertaken this offensive, several times I cast a glance at Arnold, like him, I closely followed the words of the Signals General, who continued in the same quiet voice, Germany now has a two-front war, we three were there already in 1914 to 1918 and know from our own experience how we were bled dry then, have the circumstances improved since 1918. I would strongly doubt it, I listened attentively, there was a hardly concealed mistrust in the war planning of the high command, a criticism of Hitler, disbelief in final victory, could Felgebel be disagreeing with Hitler's conduct of the war? He was speaking against the two, front war, what alternative could there be? The general turned towards me, how high have the losses been up to now? The losses from enemy action have been within reasonable boundaries. In contrast, the numbers of sick have been very high, because of the climatic conditions with which we are so unfamiliar, the fighting strengths of the infantry companies are frequently reduced to a third or less, and the hardest fighting is yet to come. With that is no happy prospect, the general ended the discussion, it was a lovely summer evening, in the distance a sheet of lightning flashed against the darkening sky. I breathed in the refreshing evening air, suddenly I shivered, I then realized that I was still wearing a thin summer jacket, 
I quickly went to my tent, my batman had already laid out my bed and blacked, out the small window, I switched on the electric light, powered by a generator, and sat down at my der, sk but I was not thinking of working, the general's words were more powerful, they sank in, forcing my thoughts along their track, actually, Felgebel had only said what anyone would have said. After sober reflection. General Felgebel flew off again the next day, none of us suspected that he would have a role to play in the conspiracy against Hitler on the, the 20th of June 1944, perhaps he had been looking for fellow conspirators among our staff and found no resonance, but we still had to go through much horror and bitterness in order to get correctly to the bottom of the military situation, not to mention the human and political crimes of this war, at that time our heads were filled with the preparations for the attack on the Soviet bridgehead west of Kalach. General Paulus had hardly any time free to devote to his friend Felgebel, if he was not absolutely committed at army headquarters, he was driving out to the divisions and regiments. He was trying to build up a personal picture of the situation and the mood of the soldiers at the front in order to improve their lives as much as possible, he mainly returned apparently silent, he was very depressed with the growing losses of troops that were already occurring even before the decisive battle. The forthcoming operation, the endangered northern flank of the 6th Army, and the sinking fighting strength of the companies were the main themes for his discussions with Major, General Schmunt, Hitler's chief adjutant, who landed in his Weissler, Stork, on our provisional landing ground, Paulus and Schmidt included me in the discussions at times, I reported plainly about the worsening personnel situation, Schmunt should also have an immediate impression of the front, line sectors that the 6th Army was preparing with the greatest concern. Therefore Paulus drove with the chief adjutant to the divisions on the northern bank of the Don, east of Klutskaya. Here it had not been possible to throw the enemy back across the Don, our divisions had only occupied an observation position there in order to conserve their strength. At the headquarters of Infantry Regiment 767, 376th Infantry Division, the commander, Colonel Steidel, described the situation, on its left when the regiment had contact with the Italian 8th Army, which had just occupied its positions. Steidel was one of our best commanders, personally brave, circumspect and esteemed by his soldiers. Paulus had known him since the First World War, and was aware that the colonel also had no inhibitions in dealing with his superiors, Steidel was also not embarrassed, despite the presence of the adjutant from Führer headquarters, to criticize the dangerous situation on the northern flank into which the 6th Army would be maneuvered, the division's losses in the last days had increased once more. Most companies now had only 20, 5 to 30, 5 men carrying arms, Paulus told me later that Steidel had forcefully demanded reinforcements. While Major, General Schmunt was still with us, the Luftwaffe reported that the enemy were bringing reinforcements across the Don near Kalach, especially tanks. This was yet another argument to demonstrate to Hitler's adjutant the necessity of bringing forward reinforcements as soon as possible, laden with the burning demands of the 6th Army, Schmunt flew onto the army group and from there back to Führer headquarters, Paulus brought him personally to our airstrip and, while saying farewell, again asked him to obtain an effective securing of the northern flank from the army high command. Another prominent visitor at this time was General Oschner, chief of the smokescreen troops, a smokescreen mortar brigade was to be attached to the army for the attack on Stalingrad. These mortars had seldom been used by the army high command, I had got to know them for the first time in the attack on Veliki Luki, their rounds raced with long fire trails and unbearable howling through the air, even our infantry, who had been told about them shortly before by the mortar company commander, anxiously ducked their heads as the rocket, like rounds flew over their positions. The effect on the surprised enemy's morale was enormous, even after the town had been taken, many of the Soviet soldiers remained as if paralyzed, General Oshner was only with us for a short while, one or two days. He discussed the tactical use of these weapons with the chief of staff, upon his leaving, Paula said to him, hopefully this does not turn out to be an empty promise, you have seen how relentless the fighting has become here, the enemy no longer gives way under our pressure, he defends himself obstinately and hits back whenever he can. We definitely need the horrors of your mortar brigade. Oshner departed with the words, you can be assured that I will not leave you in the dirt, that was generally how we dealt with our visitors. Each time it cost us considerable time and strength to inform the generals, the superior establishments had now material and knowledge enough to confirm our alarming reports, our first general staff officer, Colonel Voelter, said, Schmunt was apparently impressed when we returned from the drive to the front, 
what he had seen with his own eyes and heard on the spot had shocked him somewhat. Hopefully he will not hold back the truth from the Fuhrer, so that at last the talk about the destruction of the Red Army will end and the enemy will be taken seriously. As I see it, I said, above all General Felgable saw it clearly, in the discussion that Arnold and I had with him, he pointed out the whole situation on the war fronts more earnestly and soberly than I could have done myself until now, how General Oshner is involved, I do not know, as I only exchanged a few words with him, one can only wish that at last the truth will reach the high command. This was only a small part of Arno von Lenski's memories. I am waiting for your discussions in the comments, also do not forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel see you all soon for now.